All right, thank you for coming out to the, the first DLS after fall break. Hopefully everyone had a, a great fall break and a way to get sick like me for a good cause, so I'm fine. Bear with me. Um, I'm really excited to have Dr. Kendra Murray visiting us today from Idaho State University. Kendra and I have been really good friends for, I realize this morning, 10 years. That's what I, 10 years ago is when I moved to Tucson. Um, so it's really nice to have a good friend and colleague come and give a talk and share her work with us uh, here in the department. Um, Kendra has a really diverse and creative research program in studying the low temperature history of a variety of different rocks. From her own website, she describes herself as a geochemist interested in the processes that drive crustal evolution, mountain building, and landscape change. Something I think we're gonna hear about all three of those things today. <coughs> Um, she's joining us, like I said, from ISU, Idaho State, just up the road, two and a half hours away, where she just started an appointment as a new assistant professor in igneous processes, <coughs> igneous metrology. Um, and prior to that, she was a visiting um, faculty member at Hamilton College in New York, uh, where she taught for a year. And prior to that, she was a postdoc at the University of Michigan. And prior to that, she got her PhD and her master's at the University of Arizona is where our, our paths crossed. And prior to that even, uh, he had a stint at the University of South Carolina, right, in Dave Barbeau's lab, uh, where she got to go to Antarctica, um, and is a Carleton alum. So Carleton folks, the connections run deep. Um, so it's no question, no surprise, I should say, that there's she's here as a faculty member sharing her work with us now. Um, she's worked in Antarctica, throughout South America on a variety of projects in the Andes of the Puna Altiplano, uh, throughout the Western US, and particularly in Utah's iconic landscapes. So, um, her work and her talent has been recognized with uh, an arts fellowship, which is a really unique and special fellowship given to graduate students, as well as an NSF graduate student research fellowship, which I think all the grad students in the room are like, I want one of those. <laughs> um, She's also a very accomplished educator and, and uh, really good at outreach and engagement with a variety of different communities um, and has taught a ton of courses uh, in her various positions. Um, she's also an awesome traveler and an obligate eater like myself. And so her and my, my wife and her husband, we all like cook and eat a lot together and travel a lot together. So um, I'm gonna let her tell you about some of her scientific travels here. Uh, so take it away, Kendra. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming to my talk today. I've had a really wonderful visit, and I look forward to many years of being your neighbor up the road in Utah, Idaho. So today, I'm going to talk about how we can use the magmatic history of a region to better understand its landscape evolution. And uh, what we're looking at here is a photograph taken from an island in the sky in Canyonlands National Park. We're looking more or less south, and the confluence between the Green and the Colorado Rivers are happening right behind this mesa. Uh, for those of you who know the stratigraphy of this area, this is the, uh, the white rim sandstone here. Um, here's, uh, yeah, so we're gonna ask in this landscape, how old is it and how quickly did it form? And uh, what we're gonna talk about is the Colorado River and the, and the canyons that it runs through. So from this photograph, the Colorado River heads south through a series of spectacular canyons, including the Grand Canyon, on its way to the Pacific Basin. And the mountain range that's kind of peeking over the horizon here is the Henry Mountains, which is where we're gonna spend most of our time today. So these two questions, how old and, and how fast, are pretty obvious questions to ask about a landscape like this. So for example, if you elbow your way to the rim of the Grand Canyon in the Grand Canyon National Park, you're probably surrounded by people who are thinking about these questions perhaps for the first time. And uh, we're interested in these questions and answering them quantitatively, of course, because we're really interested in why, you know, what, what are the processes driving the creation of a spectacular landscape like this. And these questions have been asked in this part of the world for more than 150 years since geologists first explored the Colorado Plateau in detail after the American Civil War. So a lot of really important ideas in geology were developed based on the really spectacular exposures that are available to us in the Colorado Plateau region. Um, but when it comes to actually studying the evolution of the landscape here, um, this has been an ongoing challenge for us. And primarily the problem is that erosion 
is really difficult to study in deep time because fundamentally it destroys rocks, right? Especially if you're a 19th or 20th century geologist and the rock record is the main tool that you can use to try to investigate Earth's history, this is a pretty fundamental problem for you. In fact, the Cenozoic history of the Colorado Plateau region has remained enigmatic. And this is because fundamentally there are very few Cenozoic rocks preserved in this area to give us a coherent, a coherent story of what's happened. As this audience definitely knows, Colorado Plateau is located between the Basin and Range and the Southern Rocky Mountains. And the photograph on my tile slide is taken right here. The most famous feature on the Colorado Plateau is, of course, the Grand Canyon, which is located on the southwestern margin of the plateau here. We actually know a lot about the Phanerozoic, uh, particularly the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic history of the Colorado Plateau based on the spectacular stratigraphy that's preserved in the Grand Canyon region, seen here, sitting on top of the Great Unconformity, and also elsewhere on the Colorado Plateau, where much of the Mesozoic stratigraphy is still preserved today. And what these rocks tell us is that the Colorado Plateau was a depositional environment for much of the Fanner's <coughs> And at the end of the Mesozoic, when this stratigraphic record comes to a close, this is the general configuration of this area. What's now the Colorado Plateau was located at sea level in the Western Interior Seaway. In the foreland basin of this uh, orogenic system, this would be here, and the parallax lab was the subjective contour here. By the end of the late Cretaceous, the Western Interior Seaway was retreating, and this is really the end of our laterally continuous stratigraphic record across this part of the world. So we know that the Colorado Plateau region was at sea level at the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, today, the topography is essentially reversed here, where we have the plateau sitting at an average elevation of two kilometers, um, surrounded by rocks in the southern Rocky Mountains and the Basin Range that are um, significantly deformed um, during the Cenozoic time. Whereas the Colorado Plateau is puzzling because it appears to have changed its surface elevation significantly without a lot of internal deformation. And this makes it fundamentally different than other orogenic plateaus. So there are things that happen during the Cenozoic that we know from regional geology um, that are candidates related to uh, what might have caused surface uplift here and expansion. Um, so the Laramide orogeny was in the late Cretaceous to Paleogene. And on the Colorado Plateau, the Laramide manifests as these long wavelength folds and related basins. So the San Rafael Swell is an example of these features. In the middle Cenozoic, there was a massive magmatic flare-up that swept across much of the western United States and also down into Mexico. Um, this was a, a major magmatic event uh, of continental volcanism. And some have described it as potentially rivaling some of the crustal growth events in the in the Proto as well. So, this map shows the distribution of both the Legacy and the Dream and some of the earlier EC volcanoes as well. On the Colorado Plateau, a Legacy magnetism is limited to small volume plutonic complexes, um, whereas the plateau itself is kind of ringed by these much larger volcanic and plutonic systems. Finally, when we get into the Neogene, the convergent margin in this area really collapsed um, and extension in the Colorado Plateau region has been limited to the margins of the plateau, more or less. Um, so, so this area is one of the places in the world where we ask questions about what causes vertical motions of places that are otherwise stable. And I kind of took this question off to the side because the data that I'm going to show you today don't tell us a story about surface uplift. Um, we're going to be talking about estimation of erosion today, but this is one of the things that that is a large motivator. Um, broad scale for trying to understand the history of, of this region. So as I said, on the Colorado Plateau, most of the rocks are largely underwarmed. The sedimentary sections are undisturbed and just kind of flat lying. And they're really only disrupted by the Colorado River and its tributaries. But the Colorado River system is part of the enigma of the Colorado Plateau. So today, the river goes from the Rocky Mountains across the central plateau through the Grand Canyon and then out to the Gulf of California. But when we look at deposits at the mouth of the Grand Canyon here, <coughs> we can see that the modern river system didn't start delivering sediment to this area until five or six million years ago. So 
is the modern Colorado River responsible for all of the erosion that we see with the removal of those stratigraphy pieces? Mm -hmm. um, or were there paleo river systems running parts of the plateau at different times in different places? Um, again, there are questions here related to plateau uplift. If you're uplifting things in tropic base level, how does that relate to the development of this river system? So we have a pretty good sense of how much material is missing across the plateau, the magnitude of erosion here in San Jose. Um, and we can reconstruct that based on these laterally and continuous stratigraphic units and how, how much of them is missing in different places. Um, but really getting at when this material was removed is the thing that's going to help us learn more about the history of this So to, to summarize, the Colorado Plateau was uplifted since the Cretaceous, about two kilometers, and it achieved this change in surface elevation without being significantly deformed. There are extensive canyons, and we know that there's a <coughs> kilometer scale erosion in this area during the San Jose right But the modern Colorado River is only six million years old, um, and we don't have a good San Jose graph record to help us understand this place. So, what tools do we have to investigate the Cenozoic history of this original landscape? And, and also, where should we go to use these tools most effectively? So today, I'm going to talk to you about how we can use thermochronology to document the timing and rate of erosion. And as the name suggests, thermochronology tells us about the temperature and time history of rocks. And the, the systems that I use are considered low temperature thermochronometers. And this is from like a petrology perspective. So if you are a geochemist who works on surface processes, these are probably high temperatures to you. Um, so we're kind of sitting in this mid-temperature temperature realm. And rock cooling through these temperatures can be used to understand erosion and excavation. Um, because when rocks exude towards the Earth's surface, they cool off. And so we're looking at a, at a cross-section through the upper part of the Earth's crust here. And these lines are isotherms that are in equilibrium with this periodic topography. So when we use thermochronology as a tool for studying erosion, what we do is we document the timing and rate of rock cooling from our thermochronological ages. And then we interpret that rock cooling to the, be the result of a specific process, in this case, exclamation driven by erosion. And this is an important interpretive step that we'll come back to and talk about a little bit more later in the talk. The particular type of thermochronology that I am an expert in is called uranium chlorine cooling dating. And like all geochronometers, we're using the natural radioactive decay, in this case, uranium chlorine, as a clock to tell time in our materials. In this, in this system, uranium and thorium are the parent isotopes in helium, this is the daughter isotope. And so we can measure the abundance of uranium and thorium, measure the abundance of helium in our material. We can calculate how long it's been since the helium started accumulating in the crystal that we're dating. So the uranium thorium helium system is a part of the decay of uranium isotopes to isotopes of lead, which is a, a much more commonly used geochronometric system. And when uranium decays to lead, it actually experiences a whole set of alpha and beta decays and intermediate steps. An alpha particle is two neutrons and two protons, and so it's actually a helium, uh, helium atom. And so helium, just like lead, is a stable daughter product of this radioactive cuisine. The other isotope of uranium, and also thorium-232, decay to isotopes of lead um, with alpha decays as well. And so actually, a lot of helium is uh, generated during the radioactive decay of these systems. Uh, uranium helium dating was actually the very first geochronometer to be proposed by Ernst Rutherford in kind of the battle phase of our understanding. Uh, he said, well, if we knew the production rate of helium, we know how much uranium we have, we should be able to figure out how old this material is. And this idea was tried on multiple materials with multiple systems. And while um, systems like the uranium lead system generated and yielded ages that made sense pretty quickly based on the geology we understood about the material, helium ages um, were obviously problematic. So they were far too young, typically. And these chemists, you know, they understood that helium was a small little gas, not reactive. So they figured it's leaking out of our minerals. Um, but for most of the 20th century, it was unclear exactly what was causing helium to leak from the minerals. And we didn't have a good quantitative understanding of how this works. 
Um, so, you know, may be useful for specialized applications largely. Um, in the late 1990s, some important experimental work was done, and also our understanding of thermally activated diffusion was developed into a mathematical description that's actually useful for geologists. And we now know today that helium loss is governed by temperature. It's a temperature sensitive process, which is what thermally activated um, diffusivity means. So we've uh, spent a lot of time characterizing the mechanisms and kinetics of helium diffusion in multiple mineral systems in the thermochronology community. And um, I'm going to describe these kinetics, as most geologists do, as uh, this parameter called closure temperature. This is the temperature below which helium is quantitatively retained in a mineral over geologic time scales. But what it really is is just a simplification, a shorthand of these more of these kinetic behaviors of this chronometry system. This is a uh, diagram showing the range of geochronometers and thermochronometers we have available to us today in 2019. The high temperature systems are called geochronometers, and then the low temperature systems that I use a lot are. Um, thermochronometers. And the systems I'm going to be talking about today are kind of span the whole temperature range here. Um, the uranium chlorine thermal system in the mineral appetite is among our lowest temperature thermochronometers. And it has a temperature sensitivity between about 80 and 40 degrees C. And so if you use a normal geothermal gradient, you can convert that into a range of depths from which our rocks cool towards the surface. I'm also going to talk about some appetite fission craft data. This is another type of thermochronologic system. It's based on the fission decay of U238 that forms damage zones in the crystal lattices of appetites and also the circles. And these damage zones are themselves temperature sensitive. When the grains are hotter than about 120 degrees C, these fission tracks are real. They feel away, you can't see them. Um, so we can also use the accumulation of these tracks um, to infer cooling even a little bit greater depth, greater more kilometers. So the helium system is the lower temperature system, the fission craft is the slightly higher temperature system. I also am going to show you, or at least talk about, some zircon uranium line ages, and we use this system to date some tectonic um, <coughs> rocks. All right, so if I throw the uh, temperature sensitivity ranges of these two low temperature thermometers onto our diagram here, you can get a sense of why the tectonic geomorphology community was really excited when these tools became available to us. Um, they are in temperature ranges where the temperatures are sensitive to variability in the isotherms related to surface topography, um, as well as in exhumation in the upper couple of kilometers. And so it was thought, finally, we can go to a place like the Colorado Plateau, and we can get at this why, because we can actually quantitate it when these rocks came close to the Earth's surface. Um, and one of the persistent questions in this community has been how we this the Green Canyon. Um, so we were hoping that we could help address some of these questions. Um, what we found instead is that places like the Colorado Plateau really push the current limits of our ability to interpret these low temperature thermochronologic data. And one of the main reasons why this is the case here, especially in the central Colorado Plateau where I've been working primarily, is that we are dating appetites in sedimentary rocks. And these appetites are detrital, which means that when they're deposited, the clock has already started ticking and they already have a predepositional history. Um, and that makes interpreting that history somewhat complicated. So I have a little, little diagram here to help us talk about this. Here's our appetite grain, and we're going to watch it exhume through this system. And once it gets colder than its closure temperature, uh, it's going to start getting colder. And as it moves through the depositional environment and gets buried, it, the age is going to continue to get older until the grain gets warm enough for long enough to be completely reset again. And so if you're working in a landscape like the Colorado Plateau that has been carved into a sedimentary section, um, the detrital grains are going to preserve their cooling history of their provenance region unless they've been heated up enough. And so if the rocks are from an area that hasn't been buried very much, you're going to preserve or partially preserve the pre depositional history. Um, and it's really only at deeper depths where you're going to get a clean signal of what the history of landscape evolution is here. 
And, and this is really the principal challenge of working on the Colorado Plateau in these systems. Nominally, there's been enough exhumation, a couple kilometers, to get us down into rocks that should be used that. Um, but that is not the case in many places. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you how we can use the geology of the Colorado Plateau to get around this problem. And we're going to go to a place where the, um, the tribal appetites have experienced a, a thermal pulse because of the emplacement of shallow plutons into the stratigraphy. So this is an image of the LaSalle Mountains which are in the legacy black lift complex. Um, and I'm going to show you how we can work in the country rocks around these black lift complexes in order to retrieve a much cleaner signal of what the cooling history of our rocks is in the last 25 million years. There are three main black lift complexes on the Colorado Plateau. And we're going to spend most of our time in the Henry Mountains, which are right here. And zooming in a little bit on the Henry, so they're located just northwest of the Lake Powell. And you can't talk about the Henry Mountains without at least mentioning G.K. Gilbert, a um, famous geomorphologist who really, really founded process geomorphology by studying the rocks in the Henry Mountains region. Um, he and a team of geologists took a team of donkeys from Salt Lake City across, across Utah to the Henrys, and, and John Wesley Powell had deployed G.K. Gilbert to this area after seeing the Henrys while going down the Colorado River uh, in his dories. He saw this mountain range, uh, put it on his map. It was the last mountain range in the lower 48 to be mapped. Um, and thought that they looked interesting and that his, his colleague, G.K. Gilbert, should go take a look. So Gilbert was expecting to find volcanoes. Um, but what he found instead were shallowly in place intrusions that were so shallowly in place that they created space for themselves by lifting rocks above them. And he coined, coined the term black lift to describe these features. Uh, so this is the front piece to his, um, his manuscript on this uh, that shows the doming of the stratigraphy above the Henry Mountains, and then the subsequent erosion that reveals the topography that we see today getting down into those black lift rocks. This is a geologic map of the Henry Mountains region. The pink areas are those legacy and intrusive rocks, the black lifts. And the, the entire um, Permian through Cretaceous stratigraphy in this area is in, uh, in intrusive contact with the Black Lifts and Henry's, which will be in the There are five main peaks in the Henry's, each one poured by kind of main Black Lift with many satellite sills and dikes and auxiliary photonic um, features. If we zoom into the three main peaks, I can show you where we sampled for this study, which are all the teal squares here. We sampled with a particular strategy in mind. So the first thing that we did is we sampled the plutonic rocks themselves and used uranium lead geochronology to confirm the age of these intrusions um, and to really, for our purposes, figure out when did these rocks get hot because of the intrusions. And then we sampled in the country rocks and we used appetite fission track gauges to map out where the thermal boreal was that either partially or fully reset the low temperature systems. And then in the samples where this system, the impact system, was fully partially reset, um, we, need, we feel confident we can rely on the appetite helium gauges, um, which have a lower enclosure temperature, um, to tell us about just the post-magnetic cooling history of these rocks. So really what we're doing is we're using the lacklists to erase the memory of our, uh, of our detrial points. So to do this work, uh, we, we do field work for a few weeks, collect samples. Uh, our samples need to be pretty big because although appetite is common, it's not very abundant, especially in some of these sedimentary rocks. And then we do kind of standard density investigation <coughs> after rock crushing to isolate down appetite crystals, which is what you're seeing here under a petrographic microscope. We sample, um, we pick individual grains for dating here, and so we, we look for uh, grains without any internal features that are concerning full terminations, um, relatively large, and we measure their volume. And then we pack them into these little foil packets in a microscope, essentially making ravioli out of them. Um, and this is useful for a couple of reasons, makes the grains much easier to handle. Um, but it also is useful for the next step because we use a, a laser to heat up the grains by coupling the laser to the foil packet. And then this is done in a noble gas extraction line and we measure the amount of helium. 
And we take the packets and we dissolve the grains and use isotope dilution on a different mass spectrometer to measure the amount of uranium and thorium in the crystal. So at this point, we've measured the helium, we've measured the uranium and thorium, we can calculate the age. But unlike geochronometers, thermochronometers, the ages in and of themselves don't actually mean all that much. And so we use thermal history models to inform our understanding of the thermal history of these rocks with all the geology that we know about these rocks independently, as well as um, using the kinetics of helium diffusion in order to understand what time temperature histories could give us the ages. So I'm going to project the data on a north-south transect here. And the first thing to note is that, indeed, these are of the same age iconic <coughs> rocks, and the crystallization ages um, have this range of minimums, which is indicated by this line here. Now I've plotted the appetite vision track ages. And the diamonds here are appetite vision track ages from the crystalline rocks, so from the black ones themselves. And you can see they all overlap with or are slightly younger than the placement age of these rocks. And this is what we would expect. Um, these grains didn't exist before 20 or 25 million years ago. And they cooled rapidly to, earth to um, below the closure temperature of the vision track system. We know these rocks were shallowly in place for that presence. The appetite vision track ages from the sandstones uh, vary widely, depending on how far our samples were from the lab list. Um, and this is the, the point of using this system. We're using this as a filter to figure out how wide the thermal area was in that um, in some cases, we have samples that actually still have depositional ages <coughs> in the vision track system. Um, so these rocks were needed buried sufficiently to, to partially reset the system. And then there are fully reset and partially reset samples as well. All right, so now I've added the youngest grain from the appetite helium system to each of these samples. Um, and the reason I've only added the youngest grain is that uh, well, we date between five and eight, sometimes more crystals per sample, and so there would be a lot of points on here. But more importantly, there is a lot of age variability within single samples and also between samples in this data set. For some of our samples, this is what we were expecting because we know that these rocks haven't been sufficiently buried in some cases to fully reset the system. Um, but there is also another type of variability that's very common in this data set. And in fact, some of the appetites that we dated from the platonic rocks yielded helium ages that were 30, 40, 50 million years old, which isn't geologically possible, right? Those appetites didn't exist until the plutons intruded. So um, one of the things that we found, and this is going into the story would be a whole other talk in of itself, um, but there are a lot of appetites in this area that are coated in uranium, thorium rich, grungy, grains uh, material on the outside of the grains. And the reason why this is a problem is that um, they can make our helium ages uh, tens or even hundreds of percent too old because uranium and thorium stuck on the outside of the grain can implant helium into the crystal and give us excess helium to measure and therefore ages that are too old. Um, the good news is that we can distinguish the age variability that results from these phases from the useful type of age variability that I'm spending most of the rest of my so today we're interested in the thermal history of our rocks and trying to understand them. So we're going to set the data aside that show these trends um, for now um, and focus on the data that can tell us about thermal history or thermal history interpretations instead. All right, so there are a subset of samples that are relatively well behaved in this data set. But if we zoom in and now I plot all the single crystal ages on this data set, you can see that there's a wide range of variability here. Um, and I'm hoping to convince you today that this is useful age variability. <coughs> and but the question I hope that you're asking is, you know, how can grains from the same sample be two different ages, be 25 MA and 5 MA, for example? Um, all the grains from the same sample, they experience the same thermal history. Um, so how is this possible? Um, but I need to tell you a little bit more about how helium thermocology works to do this. And so we're going to start by looking at a temperature versus time plot. And temperature is increasing down here as if we're going to end to the earth. The appetite helium uh, partial retention zone is what we call the range of temperatures over which the system becomes quantitatively closed to the diffusive loss of helium. And this blue line is a simplified or uh, simple time temperature history hypothetical one for particular 
the rock. And this rock here cooled rapidly 50 million years ago. So we expect when there's rapid cooling at a certain time that all the appetite grains in the sample should have an age that represents the time in which that cooling is. So what we, what we know now is that helium ages are not only a function of time and temperature, but also the parent nuclide composition of each crystal. And this is important because it affects the mobility of helium in the crystal lattice. When uranium and thorium decay, they create radiation damage in the crystal lattice, and helium is actually sensitive to this. In the appetite system, the radiation damage forms traps in the crystal lattice that as the helium is randomly walking through the crystal, it falls into these traps and doesn't have enough energy to get back in front. These traps themselves are also temperature sensitive. They accumulate and anneal as a function of the thermal history of the grain. And so what this means is we have a coevolution of radiation damage and helium mobility in appetites. Um, the more damaged a grain is, the more helium gets trapped in it, and the the older the ages that we measure. When you visualize this in our data sets using a parameter called effective uranium, or EU, and this is just the alpha production of uranium and thorium uh, scaled and combined together. And so it's a decent proxy for radiation damage in our grains. So I've, I've added a effective uranium versus age plot here. And when we have recent and rapid cooling, a single simple cooling history, this composition of uranium doesn't matter very much because there hasn't been enough time to differentially accumulate radiation damage in helium in grains of different compositions. If instead we have a more complex thermal history, especially where rocks sat at partial retention temperatures for a long time before coming to the surface, we expect a positive slope relationship between age and this effective uranium parameter. Where the low EU grains have less damage, they're the younger ones, and they're telling us about this most recent part of the thermal history. Whereas the higher EU grains, they preserve information about the prior history uh, and, and tell us about, about processes that happened before that. So the thing that's really exciting about seeing this type of variability in your data set is that we actually have a much more sensitive chronometer uh, than we have age variability. There are far fewer tired temperature paths that can give you young and old ages in the same rock than just a single age. So in, in my data set, the helium age versus EU <coughs> grains look like this. Nice positive slope relationship where our oldest ages are hinting that there's no legacy cooling story here, and the youngest ages are telling us about cooling much more recently. Now, we purposefully sampled in an oligocene uh, magnetic complex, and so we know what this cooling signal is, uh, and we're really interested to know more about, about this and what this might tell us about the history of these rocks. So looking at the data like this is really a qualitative assessment of these effects. And what we're going to do next is we're going to use a thermal history model to quantitatively test the idea that there's a, a thermal history that can give us both of these ages and in fact this whole age trend. So that's the quantitative assessment of this. These models are built by uh, thinking about the geology and the study area and making decisions about the data and the model. Um, so I'm going to spend a little time talking about how we add the geologic record to these models. We're going to use the example of the Wingate sandstone, um, which we know was at the surface when it was deposited, and we can make um, an interpretation of what the depositional temperatures might have been at this time. And then we know, based on the local stratigraphy <coughs> that's still preserved, uh, how much Mesozoic burial there was in this area. Um, and we can convert that into a reasonable range of temperatures. Now, we don't know what happened during much of the Cenozoic, right? We don't have a good rock record here to help inform this, but we do know that the lacklists are in an intrusive contact with the whole Mesozoic stratigraphic exception. And so we know that these rocks didn't get colder, um, but they could have gotten warmer. And so we put a big box here for the bottle to explore. And then we also know that these rocks were heated up and that is constrained by the fission track of the juice system. And then finally, we know this is modern temperature today, and so we just let the model explore the space between the magmatic and the magmatic today to see what range of thermal histories are consistent with our data. 
the data that we put into the models um, look like this. We put representative ages that define the age versus the trend. And where available, we modeled the helium and the appetite vision track data together. We did this for five cycles. Um, this is the modeling program that we used for this. It's called, it's called Hefty. And the way that Hefty works is it uses a Monte Carlo search in time temperature space. So it puts time temperature paths through the space allowed here and then calculates and predicts the ages and compares those to our observations. And so we ran these models to find 100 good fit paths to the data. This is what a thermal history modeling result looks like in time versus temperature space. So you can see the temperature constraints that I talked about before in here. Um, the 100 good fit time temperature paths are these median gray lines in here, and then there is an acceptable field as well, and lighter gray is highly accurate. So let's look at the part of the model that's best constrained by the data, which is really the last 25 or 30 million years. And this is what the thermal history looks like. Um, so here, if you're interested, is what the fit to the data. Um, and this is a this is a distinctive time temperature history that's required by these data. So in order to get this age versus EU trend, our samples had to, after the magnetic event, sit at partial retention temperature, so warmer than 40, but cooler than about 60 degrees for much of the Mars. Um, and then rapidly cool to surface temperatures in the last five million years or so. And most of our good fit time temperature paths are actually staying warm until two or three years ago. We see this trend in, in all of the sample results that we modeled for this data. And so we can, we can talk about actually interpreting these time temperature histories now. So our preferred interpretation is that since five million years ago, we've seen about 40 to 50 degrees C of cooling. And this, given modern geothermal gradients in this area, translates to about one and a half to two kilometers less each. The thing that's really nice about this number is it's consistent with the or stratigraphy that's missing from this area. Um, so that's satisfying. Um, the other thing that is an interesting result here is that it suggests there is a stable Miocene landscape for uh, millions of years. Um, and that was then perturbed by this event. We have done the same approach in the Abaja Mountains and you have pretty similar results with a stable Miocene the landscape and then rapid cooling in the last five years or so. So to return to our original questions, how old is this landscape and how quickly did it form? Uh, well, in the uh, central Colorado plateau, there was a rapid erosion event in the last five million years. The magnitude of that, um, we can demonstrate. And also, there was very little mass migration here. Um, so we think, given the timing of this, this is likely a response to the integration of the Colorado River, which dropped regional base level, and we think connected what was an internally drained area of the plateau um, back out to the um, system that connected it to the So, as I hinted at the beginning, there aren't really plateau uplift implications for this story. We kind of all agree that plateau is likely where and really, thermochronology data don't directly tell us anything about surface object, although it sort of can be used to infer it if you mix up a model of information. There are other data sets from the Central Colorado Plateau that we can compare these observations to. So there are uh, late Pleistocene bedrock incision rates from Strath Terrace ages, so we can have a bullseye here. Um, and the rates that they get from this much shorter time scale agree with our longer time scale rates The other thing that we can look at is the amount of sediment deposited at the Gulf of the Colorado River, um, which Dorsey and his here um, calculated is a really nice match for the amount of material that's missing from the uh, internal part of the So I do want to say that it's possible the Pleistocene history of mountain ranges like the Henry's may not be representative of the larger human lands, which are mostly just flat and bases. And primarily that's because of uh, Pleistocene climate and the fact that uh, that really increased mountain snowpack and spring runoff in these mountain ranges. And that could impact our results in a couple of ways. Um, first, it could just locally increase bedrock erosion rates. Um, 
it's thought to be a global phenomenon by like some, seen in Mount Angus all over the world. Um, but more specifically in the Henry Mountains, uh, geomorphologists love the Henrys. And so there are a lot of people who have done cool studies in the Henrys, including looking at what when is the most geomorphic work done on this landscape. And the bedrock drainages on the Henrys are eroded by spring runoff and not by the flashy summer thunderstorms, which suggests that this might actually be an important consideration right up against the sides of the mountains. The other, the other thing that we think about is how just cooling off the groundwater can increase the impact impact the temperature of our rocks. So if you cool off groundwater, you actively depress the near surface isotherms. Um, with, with both of these things, um, this is really about are we seeing a 5MA signal or a 2 to 3MA signal? And quite frankly, that's kind of in the blur of the morphology anyway. Um, we know that these rocks sat at uh, partial retention zone temperatures for much of the Miocene and then were eroded uh, into the surface. Um, so this is more about, about the details of what processes might be responsible for the in these areas. Okay, so I have a little bit of time left. And what I'd like to do is talk about what we know um, about the Canyonlands region more broadly, kind of moving away from lack of complexes. And to do that, I need to acknowledge a couple other co-authors uh, for this study. So when I set up the problem about why it's difficult to do the morphology on Colorado Plateau using these really low temperature systems, I told you that it was because we have partially reset appetites um, that just weren't quite buried enough in order to give us a good signal. Um, and we can actually make a prediction of what the age versus the trend of grains like that would look like, what those samples would look like. Um, essentially, if they don't have this thermal event um, locally resetting the thermal history. And we would expect this pattern looks like this, where we still have a positive slope relationship between age and EU. We would expect our higher EU grades to be more retentive than healing. We'd expect the signal to be messier because it's about the starting ages and then how things are partially reset. Um, but still, this is the pattern we expect to see. In fact, we see the opposite pattern. Um, this is more than 100 single grade or 300 single grain ages from our group and other groups who have worked on the Colorado Plateau. Um, and so you can see a, a bell shape or a trumpet bell shaped curve here, um, defined on the lower side by this age versus the new trend we've already talked about but with a lot of age variability in low EU grains. So what this tells me is that we really can't attribute a lot of the age variability here by a simple partial resetting story. Uh, in fact, this type of negative slope age versus EU trend is exactly what we expect to see from the effects of implantation of excess helium or other issues with sublimation of paraglutides in, in these grains. So this is, I think, an interesting chemistry story that we have yet to solve. I think there might be a fluid flow story here, something about the mobilization of uranium and thorium. Um, again, during my talk today, I'm interested in thermal histories. Um, and so we can talk more about those data if you're interested to hear about them later. But what I'd like to say now is in this data set, there are actually a handful of samples that are not next to lacklets that do show a positive slope relationship between the G and U the type of relationship that we expect to be useful for the history interpretations. So these samples are from the deepest parts of the section exposed on the Colorado Plateau, um, basically in the canyon of the Colorado River, um, near Lace Ferry, near Height, and also near the confluence of the Green and the Colorado River. And we can take a similar approach to modeling the age versus trend as with the Henry Mountains data, but we don't have the what I would call lack of constraint in here. So the model is exploring this entire time temperature space. Um, what we see is there is still in these places a nice signal of late EEG cooling, uh, about two kilometers eroding in the last six kilometers in these areas. Based on the stratigraphy and how much necessary stratigraphy is removed above these samples, we know that there's another about a kilometer of erosion that we need to account for sometime during the Mesozoic. And so looking at the time temperature histories that we have here, um, we're really interested in thinking about this the same cooling event. Um, is this potentially the time when this extra amount of erosion happened? Oligocene rock cooling from these systems has been previously interpreted as a period of 
Cenozoic erosion um, on the southwestern margin of the plateau and also in the eastern Grand Canyon. Um, but I want to remind you that we need to take care when we interpret rock cooling as being a result of rock vaccination. Um, this is an important interpretive step, and fundamentally it needs to be based on the geology, the geologic constraints that we have. So on the Colorado Plateau, there is really nice stratigraphic evidence for a significant erosion event in the legacy in the southwestern margin and also in the south central plateau. But up in the area where I've been working, there's no independent geologic evidence of this. What we do know was happening in the middle of Cenozoic was a massive flare up of magmatic activity. So, one of the things that we've been thinking about is whether our thermochronometers that were sitting at partial retention temperatures at this time could actually just be seeing a change in the geothermal gradient that was transient in this region and not actually uh, an erosion signal at all. There has been some chatter in the literature about this mid Cenozoic history and whether it impacted the uh, history of the Colorado Plateau, um, but this has really been um, focused on changes in buoyancy and surface uplift and then vaccination as a part of that related to um, how the Cenozoic flare up changed the lithosphere of the Colorado Plateau. Uh, so the thing that we're interested in is whether we're just seeing a thermal signal, not calling upon erosion at all, but just thinking about temperature change. Really is erosion required by our data on that. All right, so the lacolists themselves tell us that there was um, magma present in the low crust during the legacy in this area. There was surface expression of a larger magmatic system at depth. Um, we know that these samples were, were collected too far away from the lacolus to be locally heated by them. Um, and so what we're talking about here is thinking about whether transient changes in the middle crust temperatures influencing the temperatures of rock sitting above the middle crust and other things. Um, we've done some modeling thinking about these questions and how to interpret low temperature thermometers in places where rocks have been perturbed by magnetic systems. And indeed, if you in place or you heat up the middle crust, if you have rocks sitting at a couple kilometers depth, they will transient, transiently feel that thermal effect, and that is sufficient to reset the thermometers. So just to demonstrate that for the purposes of this, I'm going to show you the results of a little 1D thermal model where we're tracking the particle time temperature paths in the upper crust given advection, excavation, and induction heat. And we're testing two end member ideas. Um, one is that there's about a kilometer of a legacy exhumation, or that there's no exhumation during the legacy, that it all happened before the legacy, and instead we're just seeing a transient change in the geothermal gradient, um, considering maybe the emplacement of magma at the, at the crystal depths. So the intention of this model is to not find a best fit, but to, to simply explore whether we can distinguish between these two things. So here's an age versus a U trend of uh, one of the sample suites that we've been working with. And we're looking at a predicted time, uh, predicted age versus EU trend in blue from this thermal history. So, and this thermal history is derived from this exhumation history. So time on the x-axis in both of these plots is the same, and this is in depth space. So in this situation, rock cooling is being entirely driven by X. If instead we have constant exhumation through the early Cenozoic, and then that here, and then hanging out in pressure retention depths until the late Cenozoic, but instead we just impose a thermal heat pulse, um, we get the exact same age versus EU trend. And in fact, you can put in all kinds of pre oligocene thermal histories and you get the same data because we can't see past this thermal event um, back into the past. And so, we think it's really important to acknowledge in this place that we can't tell the difference between a calendar estimation or just transient doubling of the geothermal gradient for a few years. All right, so the reason for the oligocene rock cooling in this part of the plateau, we argue, is ambiguous, and that we really need to find additional geologic evidence to distinguish between these two things. And so we think when people talk about the Colorado Plateau during the oligocene, especially here, we should call it a cooling event and then leave the actual interpretation of that event to particular places with particular rock records. 
Right. So, what have we learned about the erosion history of the Tarot Hill? Well, we see a regionally extensive Pleistocene erosion event um, that uh, exhumed one and a half to two kilometers of material, and this is the event that really carved this modern landscape. And we think the Colorado, uh, Colorado River is primarily responsible for this. And we see this signal both in the canyonlands, in the most deeply examined parts of canyonlands, as well as in the lack of provinces. In places where there's been more than, than this much exhumation, um, we know there must have been a, a additional kilometer scale running even earlier. Um, but we don't know exactly when that happened, and therefore it's difficult to say why, whether it was a fast pulse during the Laramide, if it was more slow or gradual. We really need more information to resolve that question. So I hope I've convinced you today that thinking about magmatic activity, even with these low temperature systems, um, can be really valuable. Um, it allows us to think about how to build sampling strategies to get around working in places that have a lot of complexity in their geologic record. Um, and it also challenges us, challenges us to think more deeply about what proxies are actually responsible for heating and cooling our rocks off. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.